My name is Pete Damiano. I direct the University of Iowa Public Policy Center and also on the faculty in the College of Dentistry. And um, to us in particular at the Public Policy Center, this, que this question is very important because we're academic policy researchers. We're not advocates. Our job is to do academic research to try to inform policymakers. And if we're in a political situation where policymakers don't want that information, that the discussion is all what I call at a religious or doctrinal level, and that we don't care about what the facts are, then obviously what we do is pretty useless. And so that's one of the things that makes this issue very kind of personal to us at the Public Policy Center. Another aspect of that, though, that some of you may or may not think about is that the Public Policy Center is an interdisciplinary research center in the Office of the Vice President for Research. And so the other thing that's sort of second nature to us is bringing people together from lots of different disciplines to try to address any particular challenging problem that we're facing, whether it's an environmental policy issue or transportation policy or health policy, which is my area. So one of the things that we've learned is you can't address this in the old academic way very well where you were a solo researcher and a solo author and sitting in your office and just thinking that now it really is much better to get people together from you know economics and business and whatever it might be depending on the question or engineering and really start hashing out and people are bringing different methods to the types of research they're doing but also different perspectives on the questions and the problems and the potential policy solutions and so that's one of the things that when we get people together and sitting across the aisle from each other or generally sit across from the aisle around the table I think you can have that synergy and we can learn from each other and you're going to end up with better policy as a result of that. The subtitle for this is where is the line and I just want to make very clear we're not here to say what's the right type of political discourse. Um, there is no right political discourse. It depends on the question, it depends on the people, it depends on the situation. Um, there's times the sort of what we call our sub subtitle for this is sometimes you have to scream to be heard. And so that again, it's not that it's a politeness issue, though that can be an important factor at times. But we wouldn't have had the civil rights issues, we wouldn't have had women's right to vote, if at times we wouldn't have had people jumping up on tables and screaming and yelling. And I think back um, at the time when the, the founding of the country, when we had first uh, the Articles of Confederation, and that that whole system fell apart because we didn't have enough of the central government and when then we brought George Washington in and have the discussion about actually establishing the Constitution and when those people were meeting it's not like they were all in agreement we sort of have this perception now that gee it was all kind of almost divine intervention and here was the document and isn't this great and now we're going to carry it forward around the world you know those people had very very serious differences and three people wouldn't sign the Constitution at the end and this is, but they were able to lock themselves together and hash it out and come out with something. And I think there's a sense right now by many that we're, we can't always do that and that that's one of the things that has made this question become very salient um, and to people here. Um, one of the reasons, you know, to bring people here. In, in our little local election, I live in University Heights here in town and some of you may have been following the the huge debate that we've been having over a development that may or may not happen and it's polarized and split the community and the vote last night in the election was literally a couple of votes apart. But sort of the interesting thing is that the actual democracy that went on around that and a lot of town meetings and a lot of discussion and a lot of vehemence on some people's parts, but it really was sort of that local democracy that really can play an important part in our discussion. And then as we go on through this uh, two-day symposium, we're going to be hearing both about that level, but then also as you take it up to the media and television and those types of broader issues and sort of the differences in the discourse there. So with that, I would like to introduce Sally Mason, 20th President of the University of Iowa, and I've got to believe that when she was getting her PhD in Cellular, Molecular, and Developmental Biology at the University of Arizona, she probably never thought that she would necessarily be dealing with all the political discourse and kinds of issues at that time that she now has to deal with and now has become expert at. <laughs> I don't know how expert I am. I still, on days like this, I feel more like a scientist than I do uh, any kind of an expert on political discourse. But it is my pleasure, my great pleasure, in fact, to honor and welcome you to the 2011 Fork and Brock Series on Public Policy Symposium. 
When Pete told me, uh, oh, about a year ago that he wanted to do this, I was extremely enthusiastic for many, many reasons, many of them obvious, some of them less obvious, but certainly the obvious one being that I do feel it's timely and I do feel that it's absolutely necessary. This series that uh, Pete is responsible for has become a major University of Iowa event, and I want to thank the Public Policy Center and all of the other departments and offices who have made this important discussion possible. I also want to thank all of you who here who are attending, and I know many more will trickle in during the day, Conflict and Civility in Political Discourse. This year's symposium theme is an issue of major significance, as you've heard. And it's not only becoming more so, in fact, it is only becoming more so in our current society and in the current political climate. Now, the solutions to these problems, whether it's determining where the line is to be drawn, and Pete has promised that we're not going to get that solution today, but we are going to have a good discussion, or whether it's directly adhering or altering our discourse requires proactive, deliberate participation and action, and that's what you're doing here today and tomorrow. Now, the foundation of a free and open society is free speech. But I think we all know that sometimes, and seemingly more and more often, that is a freedom people have at best misunderstood and at times abused. Here in the university, which is arguably the most free and open forum for the exploration of ideas in our society, we recognize civility as a responsibility that goes along with the right of free speech and inquiry. We all know that professors and students alike must adhere to principles of respect and civil discourse even when they disagree or discuss controversial issues. Now that seems to be a lesson more and more lost in American society. The news is too much filled with elected officials hurling obscenities, citizens calling each other vile names while discussing politics, and campaigns seeking to tear down individuals rather than to build up ideas. And we also seem to see more and more the ultimate tragedy of uncivil discourse, armed violence. When political disagreement leads to a shooting, as we saw last year with Congressman Ga Gabriel Giffords, we know something is seriously wrong. The 18th century English poet, essayist, and critic Samuel Johnson once said, when once the forms of civility are violated, there remains little hope of return to kindness or decency. And I hope that's not true. Even, this even though this symposium is asking the question, where's the line, I think there's no doubt that the line has often been crossed. Yet we absolutely must find the hope for a return to kindness and decency. We have little choice if civil society is to survive, let alone thrive. In the political and public spheres, passions will always rise, disagreements will always spark, devotions will always become zealous, and tempers will always flare. But the mark of a good society, even civilization itself, will be the heat of discourse conducted in the light of understanding, and that's the essence of civility. Perhaps the essence of civility is even simpler than that. In his biography of the great American author Henry James, literary critic Leon Edel said that James once told his nephew, three things in human life are important. The first is to be kind. The second is to be kind. And the third is to be kind. Now this is easy to say, and it's also easy to understand, but for some reason, it's hard to do for many people. This symposium will no doubt explore why that is, and I hope what we can do about it. Now, one aspect of this symposium that I'm especially excited about is the interdisciplinary character that Pete just alluded to. Again, in reference to the culture of the university, the best, most enlightening, and most innovative discourse often occurs across the disciplines. The exchange of perspectives from different dimensions of thought and practice is what often leads to the most profound discovery of knowledge. So I'm very pleased to see that this exploration of conflict and civility in political discourse involves voices from many sectors, both inside and outside the academy, 
as well as many disciplines from history to communications to politics to art. Having this discussion here at the University of Iowa, I think, is entirely appropriate. We have a great history of academic innovation, such as being the first university to give academic credit to creative work. And we're located in the state that is the first to, to declare whom we think should be the nominee for the President of the United States. Now, regarding the latter, it's no surprise that the way we make our decision is by talking with the candidates as much as we can, face to face and respectfully. It was certainly something I had to get used to when I came to Iowa. I had no idea how personal it really is. And then discussing it amongst ourselves in our community school, gyms, churches, firehouses, and public libraries on caucus day. So welcome once again to our campus, our community, our great state of Iowa, and welcome to this important conversation. I know it will be engaging, enlightening, inspiring, thought-provoking, and civil. Thank you. It's now my great pleasure to introduce to you Scott Racker, who is Executive Director of Character Counts in Iowa, a grant-funded institute at Drake University. Character Counts' mission is to recognize, enhance, and sustain the positive qualities of Iowans in order to promote civility through character development. From preschool to the corporate boardroom, Character Counts works to create a positive environment of civility and principled decision-making in our daily lives. Mr. Racker is also a member of the Iowa House of Representatives, where he chairs the Appropriations Committee and previously chaired the Ethics Committee. He's involved in numerous civic volunteer efforts, serving as a board member of the Iowa Natural Heritage Foundation, Drake University School of Education, National Advisory Board, Josephson Institute of Ethics Board of Governors, and Shining City Foundation and board member and former chair of the Midwest Council of Government's Legislative Leadership Institute. Mr. Racker received a BA in Political Science and Religious Studies from Grinnell College, and he's certified, he is a certified character development specialist and corporate ethics trainer through the Josephson Institute of Ethics. Please welcome Scott Racker. Thank you very much, President Mason. That's a gracious introduction, uh, but even beyond just being kind, your remarks uh, exceptionally well prepared. It's very difficult to follow those, uh, but I am so honored to be invited by you as well as the Public Policy Center and uh, Dr. Damiano to give a brief welcome to all of you uh, today as we focus on this critical topic. And I, I'm really intrigued by the fact that Dr. Damiano, uh, as a dentist here at the Dental College, is also serving as the director of the Public Policy Center. Uh, I have a soft spot in my heart for the Iowa Dental College, and dentist from that college is my grandfather, who was a graduate in 24, and my father in 59, and uh, very proud of the efforts of what this institution has provided through dentistry. But to see a dentist serving in this role of leading a public policy institute and the engagement of discussions here is really critically important, and I want to acknowledge that. And I know a little something, or at least have an appreciation for the balance of dual roles. As we're blessed in Iowa to have a citizen legislative process, and I have a full-time real-world job and passion as the executive director of Character Counts in Iowa. That's what I do for a living. That's my passion. And at the same time, I've had the privilege and honor to serve in the state legislature. And it's given me a unique perspective, I feel, at least to have a grasp of the issues that are before us as we talked about conflict and civility and political discourse. And where is the line? I would state for you that on July 11th, 1804, the line was crossed when sitting Vice President of the United States, Aaron Burr, shot and killed our former Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, in a duel that resulted from a long-standing political bitterness. Uh, and in that particular period of time, Hamilton had disparaged the character of Burr in his seeking the vice presidential nomination and then the New York gubernatorial nomination was successful in doing that, which resulted in the duel. And maybe when we hear some historical perspectives, we'll think of that. But that was common practice at the time when we had political differences to challenge each other to duels. I'd also say on May 22, 1856, 
the line was crossed when Senator Charles Sumner was caned to unconsciousness on the floor of the Senate chamber by Representative Preston Brooks. And from the United States Senate history, I pulled this, I find this fascinating. The inspiration for this clash came when Senator Charles Sumner, a Massachusetts anti-slavery Republican, addressed the Senate on the explosive issue of whether Kansas should be admitted to the Union as a slave state or a free state. In his crime against Kansas speech, Sumner identified two Democrat senators as the principal culprits in the crime, Stephen Douglas of Illinois and Andrew Butler of South Carolina. He characterized Douglas to his face as a noisome squat of a nameless animal, not a proper model for an American senator. And Andrew Butler, who was not present, received a more elaborate treatment, mocking the South Carolina senator's uh, known stance as a man of chivalry. The Massachusetts senator charged him as taking a mistress who, though ugly to others, is always lovely to him, though polluted in the sight of the world, is pure in his sight, I mean the harlot slavery. Representative Preston Brooks was Butler's South Carolina kinsman, and he had believed Sumner to be a gentleman, he would have challenged him to a duel. As it was, knowing that he was also short of character, he went to the Senate. He carried with him a metal-topped cane that was used mostly to beat dogs, and he beat him on the head. He struck him again and again, and Sumner rose and lurched blindly out of the chamber, futilely attempting to protect himself. Interestingly enough, bleeding profusely, Sumner was carried away. Brooks walked calmly out of the chamber without anyone saying or doing anything. The interesting point of this is that both men became heroes in their respective areas of this country at the time. Sumner, the man that was beaten, did recover and served another 18 years. Brooks resigned his seat and he was re-elected soon after by his constituents. And it was that diffusion, very honestly, that continued to perpetuate in this dysfunctional civility at the time that led to our Civil War. So I give you that as context for today to at least acknowledge that maybe we have made some progress in this arena. And then again, concurring with the President, I'm not sure we have, because I believe the line obviously was crossed on January 8, 2011, with the mass shooting in Arizona, where Congresswoman Giffords was shot and 18 others and six killed. And the gunman, who has since been ruled incompetent to stand trial, was noted as a radical political loner. This incident itself has given rise to the creation of the National Institute for Civil Discourse, which is being chaired by former President Bill Clinton and former President George H.W. Bush, formerly political rivals. Many are calling this a modern-day tipping point as it comes to the discussion of civility in our society, and I believe in institutions such as the University of Iowa, it's significant that we have these conversations on these campuses. Character Counts, as you heard, is a mission to enhance civility through character development, and we're working on professional initiatives in this state, such as the Better Together Speaker Series and the Speak Your Peace Initiative, which is built not to end disagreements, but to improve public discourse by simply reminding ourselves of some basic rules of respect. Pay attention. Be aware of those things the world has around us. Listen, focusing in on what others have to say to better understand their point of view. Being inclusive, welcoming all groups and citizens working for the greater good of the community. Don't gossip. And don't accept it when others choose to do so. Show respect. Honor people with their opinions, especially in the midst of our disagreements. Be agreeable. Look for opportunities to agree even in our disagreements without negating our disagreements. To apologize, to be sincere about that and genuine. To repair damaged relationships through that. To give constructive criticism even while disagreeing. And to take responsibility by not shifting responsibility and blame to others. Those are fairly simple tasks, and the reason that I wanted to lay those out in my welcome is my hope of this is that this dialogue goes more than just discussion and listening, but into action. It's very simple in areas of civility and especially in political discourse to point our fingers at those that are not living up to the standards we would believe to be that of great civility. It's much more difficult for us to look inwardly, to ask ourselves, are we acting in a capacity 
that would be deemed as civil behavior in our political discourse. And that happens not only at the state capitol, it happens in our coffee shops and in our classrooms. So my welcome to you is actually a challenge. And I want to thank you for the time to come and to participate. Dr. Damiano had asked me to think of a situation where I might have experienced incivility or civility and uh, in the political arena. And in full transparency and even knowing that this is uh, being taped, I'm going to give you a most recent experience and one that's a reflection of my key point to you, which is we need to look inward rather than point fingers at what others do. I had the opportunity several weeks ago to uh, be on the campus for our fiscal committee meeting, uh, where all of the presidents of the university met with the key legislators involved with our uh, appropriations, ways, and means in state government. It was an opportunity for each president to give a presentation of the wonderful things happening at their universities and how their budget process works so we could provide questions of inquiry. After the meeting, it was pointed out to me by a person that I respect greatly that in my tone of questions, my tone of questions to the three presidents, their perspective was that it was clearly evident I had a different tone with President Mason than I did with the others, possibly a sharper, more critical tone. And I thought about that, and it's really troubled me. It's troubled me greatly because I try to be equitable in how I treat people in my public service. The first thing I did today when I got here was I sought out the president as we had an opportunity so that I could apologize to her because that's not who I am or how I would want to behave and it's not what she should expect from me in the future. And I hope that helps build the relationship. And I give that to you because when we talk about civility, when we talk about a dialogue of crossing the line, it's not just when somebody goes to a parking lot and shoots somebody. It's when you're having a conversation with two well-educated people trying to serve the state of Iowa best they can, but not even dialoguing in a way that would let others believe that you can have civil discourse. And that is what I believe we should be focusing on now and in the near future, is what can we each individually do to become better in our own areas of civility. I'm honored to have had an opportunity to say a few remarks. I welcome you to this symposium, and I hope we have some action that comes out of it individually. Thank you very much for your time and attention.